Since the dawn of time, man has found refuge underground. Skeletons, cave drawings and ancient tools tell of our ancestors using caverns for shelter and as hiding places. As man became more adept at engineering, he was able to dig deeper and construct bigger and better underground structures. From smugglers' passages to hidden fortresses, from forgotten mines to wartime bunkers. Discover the secrets you were never supposed to know. Travel to the places you were never supposed to see in The Secrets of Underground Britain. Travel back through time to discover tales of Britain's hidden caves, forgotten catacombs and mysterious tunnels. Unearth the tale of Edinburgh's secret underground city, once the home to almost a million people and thought to be lost forever. Reveal the mysteries of the Hellfire Caves. Uncover secret tunnels that exist beneath the city of Liverpool. And journey below the crowded pavements of Brighton to discover a staggering network of Victorian sewers. But first, travel back to a time when tunnels and caves provided safe storage for one of Britain's oldest and most illegal pursuits, the art of smuggling. There are smugglers' caves all around Britain, and this museum in Hastings contains many clues to show what the life of a smuggler was actually like. During the 1700s and 1800s, there was over 40,000 people employed in the smuggling trade just on the south coast alone. Probably the most famous uh, smuggling gang of all operated, which was the Hawkehurst Gang. Uh, Hawkehurst is a little village about 15 miles from Hastings, but they basically they joined up with a few other gangs, the Hastings Gang and the Goldhurst, to form one of the largest smuggling gangs in history. There were over five, 600 strong at the time. And they were basically a gang of murderous thugs. I mean, they would make the Mafia look like pussycats nowadays. They ran basically from uh, London down, and they stretched all over the south coast right down to Paul. And they got to such a stage where they didn't even bother doing their smuggling runs at night. They were so confident that nobody would interfere. And they put terror into hearts of people that they would actually run their smuggling goods during broad daylight. In 1700, a British farm labourer would earn about seven shillings a week, but for one night's work carrying barrels from the shore up to and into the smugglers' caves, he could net ten shillings over a week's wages. And this pub in St Agnes Cornwall, like many in this part of the country, still has a secret passage that once ran from behind the bar to caves on the shore below. But it wasn't just wreckers, rogues and dishonest sailors that were involved in smuggling. In 1780, the Right Honourable Temple Luttrell, a member of Parliament, built this classic Georgian folly on the shore of the Solent near Southampton. Inside, a secret passage runs from the basement to a door that leads onto the shore. Rumours circulated that he was a prolific smuggler and the true purpose of the building was to allow his men to keep a lookout from the top of the turret whilst others landed the contraband. Probably the most ingenious of all the gangs was the Aldington Gang, which was operating in the early 1800s with a gentleman called George Ramsley. Now he ran it a bit more like a business. Um, he employed an accountant and a secretary, which was actually his son. He also employed uh, foreign suppliers. He had his own fleet of ships and he also employed labourers to take the smuggled goods to the hiding places. In the early 17th century, the punishment for smuggling was imprisonment, or if you wanted to avoid that fate, you could agree to be inducted into the Royal Navy, which was believed to be an even harsher sentence. 
However, these punishments failed to deter the gangs from continuing their wicked trade, and by the 18th century, the penalty for smuggling was death. The history of these caves in Hastings is not just related to smuggling. During the Napoleonic Wars, they were also used as a hospital. Another strange secret can be found in this place. It's a chapel deep underground. Who built it and who worshipped here and even who they worshipped is still unknown to this day. It's said to have been St Clement, but it, it certainly predates the modern naming of the caves. And if you have a close look at the statue, it, I think it actually looks quite pagan. It actually looks more like the god Pan. If you have a look, he's got the shaggy legs and the pointy bits on the forehead and the pointy ears. I would imagine it dates back probably to those times. But not all tunnels are located on our coastlines. Many are buried beneath Britain's busiest towns and cities. In Exeter, Devon, shoppers go about their business, many blissfully unaware that they're walking over an ancient set of tunnels originally dug in the 14th century. These passages originally housed lead pipes that carried fresh water into the city. In the 17th century, amid the English Civil War, Exeter was held by parliamentary forces, and the tunnels were partially blocked to prevent royalists storming the city. At the same time, much of the lead pipes were ripped out and melted down to be reused as bullets, leaving the tunnels empty and redundant. In Royston, Hertfordshire, there are a set of tunnels said to be excavated and decorated by the ancient order of the Knights Templar, warrior monks who protected pilgrims traveling to the Holy Lands. Though outlawed in the 14th century, their legacy lives on today. A group claiming to be modern-day Templars have claimed another network of tunnels running beneath the streets of Hartford as their own, and have issued death threats to anyone foolhardy enough to enter their subterranean lair. Further north lies one of Britain's most elaborate underground secrets, buried deep beneath the streets of modern Edinburgh. For almost 250 years, a giant defensive wall surrounded Edinburgh. Unable to expand its boundaries, it became the most densely populated city in Europe. Multi-storey tenements were built to alleviate the crisis, but they were an unsightly scar on the city's skyline, and the decision was taken to build over them. A series of bridges were erected, one on top of another, to even out the lay of the land around the Royal Mile, creating flat, smart streets. The space inside the newly built arches were converted into workshops from where cobblers and other artisans toiled. However, over time they became occupied by a very different type of inhabitant. Over a million of the city's poorest and most dispossessed live within this city, beneath a city. Surrounded by darkness and misery, they were ignored by the chroniclers of the time. Later the tunnels were bricked up and deliberately forgotten. The rich and powerful of the day did a remarkable job of denying that this underworld city had ever existed. But recent exploration has provided fascinating insights into this subterranean hellhole. But what remains of this city today? They discovered um, bits and pieces of old raw materials, little shoes from the cobbler's room, bottles, the usual sort of artifacts you would expect that when you excavate somewhere where legal businesses have actually worked. The heyday for the vaults was 1788 to 1796, as far as this area is concerned, there would have been about 30 to 40 people working in about 10 rooms down here. When the engineers designed Edinburgh South Bridge, they actually forgot to damp proof it against the rain, and of course, you know it never rains in Edinburgh. So water coming down to this level became an issue. 
So by 1796, within eight years of the actual opening of the South Bridge, the legal businesses that worked down here started to leave. And this process is more or less completed by about 1800. All the legal businesses leave. That, of course, leaves a void. And coming down here to fill the void, all the criminal classes of Edinburgh. So suddenly, the vaults become a place of high levels of criminality, gambling dens and drinking dens, and of course drugs in those days, absinthe, opium, laudanum, squatters. People would come down here to spend the night down here and then go back out onto the streets of Edinburgh in the morning begging and stealing. So the whole place is sordid and violent. People obviously being attacked with knives, people are being attacked with bottles. People came down here, as I say, and were never seen again. And we've got a couple of examples of ghosts who are said to have been people who met their ends down here. Historically, Edinburgh is notorious for body snatching. The most infamous practitioners of this foul trade being Burke and Hare. Experts believe that the snatched bodies were stored here before being sold to doctors who used the corpses for anatomy demonstrations. A tunnel leads from this chamber directly to Edinburgh's old medical college. This hideous trade and other dark deeds that took place in this chilling labyrinth have left their mark and many believe the tunnels are haunted by a series of ghosts. Of all the haunted rooms down here, this is the most haunted. This is the caretaker's room and it's the residence of the most malevolent interactive spirit down here and that's the watcher. He is the most malevolent spirit down here. Your presence here is disrespectful, this is offensive. He is the spirit down here who's most likely to attack you. By the 19th century, this warren of crime and disease was an embarrassing sore on the face of Edinburgh. The government of the time decided to brick the tunnels up. Many believe that the plague broke out here and they buried hundreds of pox-ridden souls beneath its streets. Whilst Edinburgh secretly housed the poorest and most dispossessed members of society, hundreds of miles south in leafy Buckinghamshire, the activities of a gang of Britain's most noble and wealthy men would cause a scandal that reverberates to this day. Sir Francis Dashwood, English rake, politician, and once Chancellor of the Exchequer, formed a group that was later to be called the Hellfire Club. The members reputedly hired prostitutes to dress up as nuns and conducted mock religious rituals over the bodies of naked aristocratic ladies. Originally, the Hellfire Club met in a ruined abbey on the banks of the Thames, but their activities quickly became the subject of gossip, so they adjourned to the privacy of these caves in Dashwood's estate. The caves stretch for over a mile into the hillside, and there is rumoured to be a secret passage leading from the caves to the church on top of the hill. However, no one has been able to locate it. But a series of Roman numerals carved into one of the walls are said to be a clue to the entrance, as is this poem. Take twenty steps and rest a while, then take a pick and find a stile, where once I did my love beguile. T'was twenty-two in Dashwood's time, perhaps to hide this cell divine, where lay my love in peace sublime. Strange carvings of screaming faces are etched upon the walls. And at the bottom of the caves runs an underground river named the Styx, after the mythical river that souls must cross to enter hell. While Sir Francis Dashwood and his aristocratic friends built his underground playground for fun, other underground passages can be found from the tip of Cornwall to the hills of Wales, from the coast of Kent to the moors of Yorkshire that have a darker and more blood-stained history. It's not the history of the aristocrats, but of the poor working-class men who toiled in the dark day after day, week after week. In Britain's mines. 
Sometimes the tell-tale ruins of picturesque pumping stations will give away the fact that there are a series of underground mines nearby. In other places, these have crumbled away to almost nothing, and if you are not careful, you may stumble upon a mine shaft plunging vertically deep into the ground. I'm 150 feet underground at the Wheel Roots Mine in Cornwall, and you can see the dark, cramped, and wet conditions the miners had to put up with. They'd worked for about eight to ten hours a day, the men would have. Obviously climbing down wooden ladderways to where they were working. Some of the ladderways in Cornwall would have been over a thousand feet deep. The boys from the age of eight or nine would have worked down here. They'd have worked for six or eight hours a day and again climbing down ladderways to where they would have been working. Uh, usually working in running water, very dangerous conditions, using explosives which again were very dangerous to use and mainly using hand tools um, for drilling and breaking the rock up. But it isn't just in Cornwall that you can stumble upon secret underground worlds. It was the first quarry I ever discovered, purely by chance, with a, with a friend of mine way back in the oh, mid-1960s. Um, and we were just playing in the woods at Brown's Folly. And we found a crevice in the rock, a small gap in the rock, climbed in behind this rock, cleared a few boulders out of the way. And gradually, as we cleared the boulders, we found the corridor we were in was getting bigger and bigger. And found ourselves eventually in this huge network of underground workings which we later found out was old abandoned Victorian quarry workings which extended over something like 300 acres you know we, there were corridors disappearing in the distance in all directions quarter of a mile long half a mile long it was unbelievable um, but that as we found out later was only a small part of it you know, we'd found Moncton Farley mine which was about three or four hundred acres I suppose but around the whole of North Wiltshire you know in the area that I, I know well there are literally thousands of acres all of the fields in North Wiltshire are undermined by the, this rabbit warren of worn out worked out quarry workings around about 100 feet underground and it's not just empty tunnels that can be found in Britain's mines many still have machinery and tools left intact undisturbed for decades as if time itself had stood still there's nothing more exhilarating than, than going into a mine and finding machinery still there. And before I got interested in the underground, I was interested in water mills and windmills. And uh, to go into an underground mine and find underground water wheels, which powered all the equipment in the mine, is, is something that's it's rare. One of the most spectacular ways of obtaining power was via underground water wheels. And one of the finest examples is in the Ustrad Anon copper mine in North Wales. You go to the bottom of the shaft, you've got workshops there, uh, you've got lathes, you've got tools, uh, and you've got this massive water wheel, still there uh, where, it, where it was placed in the uh, earlier 20th century, and it was an amazing sight to get into this old miner's workshop, 350 foot uh, below ground. As you can imagine, uh, you know, having to go that far down, not many people actually get to go there. That is probably one of the most interesting underground places I've been to in the United Kingdom. Anyone who is in, interested in exploring a mine um, shouldn't go in by themselves um, before they even contemplate going into any abandoned workings. They should look into mine rescue organisations or caving organisations to learn about the mines properly. Many of the techniques used by the miners down here were often developed by engineers in a military context. At the start of the 19th century, Napoleon Bonaparte had waged a brilliant campaign and was master of Europe. He had 160,000 men stationed at Boulogne and had ordered a fleet of barges to transport them across to England. Over the channel in Dover, thousands of British soldiers needed to be housed to face this French threat. 
Within the iconic white cliffs, a series of tunnels, passages and barracks were constructed, worming their way deep into the white chalk. Work started on this underground fortress in 1806. It was designed to house as many as 2,000 troops and was part of a massive series of forts, batteries and martello towers that were constructed as a response to the very real fear of imminent invasion. This particular system was built under the ramparts of Dover's famous castle. One way to enter the barracks is down this unusual double spiral staircase. It allows two columns of troops to ascend or descend simultaneously, a classic example of ingenious engineering. The tunnels, bored out of Dover's famous white chalk, lead to a series of massive brick-lined barracks called casemates. Originally built as part of the overflow barracks for Dover Castle and probably planned out by a Brigadier Colonel, um, William Twiss, who did a lot of the Napoleonic fortifications along this stretch of the coastline um, around the Napoleonic period. Originally opened up to house 2,000 men underground here. Their main use in the Napoleonic period was for a barracks for troops that would have been fighting in this area, waiting for the Napoleonic invasion, or going across to either Portugal, France or Spain um, to actually fight against Napoleon Bonaparte over there. They're built very solid constructions, they're a parabolic arch at the top of the casemates which is a very strong shape um, and then the walls of the casemates can be anything up to eight courses of brick thick, that's about three and a half feet or a metre of brick in the walls. Um, this, combi this combination of a very strong brick structure within a, a soft absorbent chalk cliff make them a great bomb proof shelter um, which is why they were set out here in the first place. The soft chalk walls proved to be an irresistible surface for troops and visitors to score a record of their passing. The oldest piece of graffiti we have in the tunnels here is actually a, a woman's name. Um, it says Mary Ford 1807 um, and we've really no idea who Mary Ford could have been. Um, it's possible that she was the wife of a, another engineer who worked in this area, um, a gentleman called um, William Ford, um, who was another royal engineer who's in this area, so um, possibly that's him. But uh, yes, it's a great record of some of the people who've made their way through the Dover tunnels, either heading off towards France to fight Napoleon Bonaparte or from other periods of history as well. Fortunately for Mary Ford and her friends, the invasion never materialised and the Duke of Wellington was soon pushing Napoleon's troops back across Europe. The tunnels and passages subsequently lay unused for many years and from the tranquil grounds of the castle above, you would never guess what secrets lay beneath. After the Battle of Waterloo, Europe was still in turmoil. The then Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, ordered even more forts and tunnels to defend us from a possible attack. And Crown Hill Fort in Plymouth is a classic example of his grand plan. Up here at ground level it's pretty much like any other fort, with thick walls and gun emplacements all around. But its secrets lie underground, where the architects and engineers of the day considered all the eventualities that just might occur. This doorway leads to an underground passage which is called the Chemin de Honde, which literally means the way round. Now this runs right around the fort and allows the soldiers to get to any part of the fort which is under attack without having to expose themselves to enemy fire above ground. This was the cartridge store. These are the ammunition boxes, they're specially made, they're zinc lined as well to protect the shells. Now when the shells are needed, they're taken up through this little chute, 
up to where the gun emplacement is up above. Now, if the gun emplacement was taking a direct hit, hopefully the shells down here would be safe. The last thing you want in the raging battle is to have a whole load of ammunition go off on you. I'm down here in the East Caponier, deep in the fort, protected by massive walls are this pair of cannons. Now they would have been filled with hundreds of small metal balls and were designed to send waves of shot raking through the mass of any attackers in the ditch outside the fort. Ready? Fire! On the outer perimeter of the fort lies this cramped and eerie tunnel. It's a marvellous example of the lengths the engineers went to to try and preempt all manner of potential assaults. Even if a battle was raging above, down here all would be still and quiet due to the specific design of this remarkable tunnel. It's called a countermining gallery and men would stand here silently listening for the sound of an enemy soldier trying to mine under the fort's defences. If they heard the sound of digging, their job was either to try and break into the tunnel and attack the miners, or place a large barrel of gunpowder above them and blow them up. Another legacy of our underground past can be found in the place names in many of our towns and cities. Names that refer to sites where prisons once stood. Prisons that would have housed deep, dark cells, fetid and dank beneath the ground. On the south bank of the Thames, you can still find Clink Street. The Clink was an infamous prison that records show was in use as early as the 12th century. By 1761, it was described as a dismal hole, and it was burnt to the ground during the Gordon Riots of 1780. All that remains today is the street's name and a small museum telling the story of its wretched past. Another infamous prison of that period was Newgate. Like the Clink, it was also attacked in the Gordon Riots, but the main building wasn't demolished until 1902. However, if you visit the pub built on the site of the old prison and ask the barman nicely, he might show you down to the cellar where amongst the barrels and pipes lay two cells all that remains of Newgate Prison. Tunnels, passages and caverns are dotted all over the country, but one of the most astonishing is here in the city of Liverpool, famous for another type of cavern. But further north in the city lies a mysterious warren of brick tunnels that have been looked after and restored by an eager group of volunteers. Many people in Edge Hill knew the tunnels were here, but nobody really bothered with them, they just accepted them until we found out that the little city council were about to redevelop the area and we feared for the tunnels then, so we formed this organisation to try and protect and save them for future generations. Been doing it now for 10 years, and let's hope you see it, excuse the pun, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnels were built for a merchant called Joseph Williamson. He had married into the famous sugar family, the Tates, and ran a branch of their business dealing with tobacco. Being a successful merchant in the city means we can still find his portrait in Liverpool's Walker Art Gallery. The tunnels began their life somewhere around 1818, maybe a little bit beyond when Joseph Williamson retired from work and came up here to Edge Hill. He spent approximately, we gather, around £100,000 on these tunnels, also the houses in Mason Street that he built as well, which mm, were quite to somewhere around £22 million today. He employed soldiers returning from the Napoleonic Wars. He gave them the work, put bread on their table, 
and they returned his favours with building such labyrinths as this. Giving the soldiers the work was most likely an act of philanthropy, but why he wanted the tunnels dug is still a complete mystery. The work earned Williamson the nickname, the Mole of Edge Hill. Nobody knows why these tunnels were built. We've tried to find some way of putting some logic into these tunnel spaces. We just can't find, so actually now we just accept that they're here. When Les and his team started to explore Williamson's tunnels, most were blocked by rubble and household rubbish dating back decades. As they've cleared out the tunnels, they've unearthed hundreds of fascinating artefacts. They've also discovered that in places, the tunnels are two or three stories deep. All we know is this is the tip of an iceberg, where we are now. It's a drop in the ocean to what's around here somewhere, and we really need to find them. We really need help from anybody and everybody to get these tunnels found, opened up to the world, and let them see just what we've got here. Williamson's tunnels in Liverpool are fascinating, but they're not the only network of tunnels built by wealthy landowners. The 5th Duke of Portland built a network, a labyrinth of tunnels at Welbeck Abbey in Staffordshire. It's absolutely huge, but they won't let us in. Somewhat smaller at Whitley Park near Guildford, uh, there's a very, very strange underground structure beneath a lake, an underground ballroom. Uh, and again, that's currently under redevelopment, and I'm afraid we can't get into that one either at the moment. Whitley Park was developed by a businessman named James Whitaker Wright in the 1890s. Though the structure is out of bounds today, there are historians who not only knew about the room, but also visited it in the past. This is an illustration from the Royal Magazine of the 1920s and shows the tunnel which led under the water, the underground room with Neptune on top, and here is the level to which the water would ultimately come when the lake was refilled. And this from the same magazine shows a gentleman smoking um, and it is said that there was a, a pipe which led up through Neptune um, through which any excess smoke could uh, go. This is a photograph I took in 2000 and shows the underground room now with a very yellow light that's due to the algae. Um, in its heyday trainee divers were brought here and they went down and cleaned the outside of the uh, glass. It was about um, 20 feet in uh, di diameter. Uh, I have met some people whose parents went down there in the 1930s with a wind-up gramophone and had dancers. But you can see here, there's the tunnel going through to the bottom of the base, and that's very interesting because the shape of that tunnel exactly reflects the shape which you will now see if you stand on the Bakerloo Line station. And as Whitaker Wright was involved in the financing of the Bakerloo Line uh, in the 1890s, we must assume that these were bits of tunnelling that were excess to requirements at the time. Going down there now, um, it's fairly damp and dank down, down there, but it still has a certain amount of magic. And you can imagine people in the old days when it was all clean, and the, there were lights in there and the fish coming outside and pressing their noses up against the glass and, you know, to see what was going on. You can imagine it would be an absolutely magical place. Whitley Park was just one manifestation of the attitude that flourished under the reign of Queen Victoria. Her stern manner changed the way Britain viewed themselves, both when alive and when dead. The old church graveyards were full to bursting with God-fearing folk, so Victorian entrepreneurs came up with a solution – large, fashionable landscape cemeteries. The first was built at Kensal Green in North London. And the Victorians didn't stop with the usual monuments at ground level. They also offered the public the chance to be laid to rest deep underground.
So which came first, the catacombs or the cemetery up above? Oh, the cemetery very much so, because London was overcrowded at this point in the beginning of the 19th century, and they needed places to put people. By about 1840, there were something like 40,000 people dying a year in London. So you can well imagine the congestion in the city churchyards. Um, it was very lucky if you, you stayed in the ground as much as three months before they more or less came in and dug you out and put somebody else in on top. Sorry to say, grave diggers not only had spades, they also had choppers to dispose of undecayed bits of body. And the usual practice was to dig a hole in the corner of the graveyard and then put that pieces in there. Coffins would be sold off for firewood. And something really needed to be done about this. The chap that really took the challenge up in London was a chap named George Frederick Carden. When were the catacombs opened? Well, they opened a little bit later than the cemetery, which opened in 1833. Obviously, it took some time to build them. They, these ones basically opened in 1838. They're very extensive. They've got a space here for something like 4,000 coffins, and to date, it's about three quarters full. The churchyards only added up to less than 10 acres. Um, in total, there were seven of these so-called magnificent seven cemeteries opened from 1833, Kensal Green, right through to 1841. And in total, they added up to 300 acres, which is a vast difference from less than 10. So you can see this made enormous difference to London. Would you want to be buried here? I think it'd be rather nice down here. Um, there's some talk about re whitewashing it. I think that will be quite something. And if the chapel is ever restored, then it will be illuminated by natural light. These round holes in the ceiling were originally glass lights that emitted sunlight. What kind of people are buried here? Well, all sorts, but uh, down in the catacomb, it's mainly middle class. This is quite an interesting one. It's a gentleman who died in India. Um, his coffin was packed off and sent off to Kensal Green. Obviously, he knew that was a good place to be buried. But unfortunately, no money came with this, nor any instructions. So here he lies, probably for eternity. Here we have the mortuary table. Um, this is no more than two slabs set on edge. But this is the first port of call for most of the coffins that came down here. Lots of coffins actually came down in the catacomb, just on a temporary basis. Obviously, people die suddenly, and nobody's thought about buying a plot or you know, thought about putting a mausoleum up. So here they may well rest for quite some time. These two particular coffins now have been here for quite some time, so they're not moving anywhere. Tell me about this. These domes are interesting, aren't they? Yes, they're very popular with the Victorians, these immortal domes. Inside you've got porcelain flowers, ornately made, and the greenery is actually stamped brass that would have been painted originally green. Now, this is the real unique secret here, isn't it? Yes, we're very proud of our hydraulic catafalque. This is the device which lowers the coffins from above down to the catacomb below. Originally, this catafalque was actually worked by cogs, and that was not seen to be a very good way. It was a noisy and it was very disruptive because it didn't always work. So they got Braemar and Robinson in in the 1840s to put it into hydraulics. It actually works literally by water pressure. It comes down under its own weight and then it's pumped up again, literally pumped up by hand to the chapel above. Another amazing set of catacombs built in London were built not for people, but for horses. Camden catacombs basically were built by the railway company uh, as uh, a means of getting goods uh, onto the railway network. There were a number of massive goods depots in the Camden area and a lot of the goods were brought in by horse. So they built um, a series of horse tunnels so that horses could actually bring the goods into the lower floors of the goods warehouse. But there was also an underground wharf. Um, the, uh, uh, the goods depots were adjacent to the Regent's Canal. So they built uh, a short branch from the Regent's Canal um, into what is a, a sort of central marshalling area beneath the depots. Uh, so we'd have the, the horse tunnels, um, the canal barges, all concentrating on this one point at Camden beneath the goods depots. And so it was a, a major um, point of access uh, to the railway network for goods traffic. We found underground stables, um, and we're 
you know, dating back to the, the Victorian age here. The straw was still on the floor. It was amazing. The horses had been in there. We walked along the horse tunnel, um, decrepit, falling down, um, but it was a, an, an, an amazing place. Secret underground locations have been used in every facet of life, be it for fun, war or even death. But every city or town has an extensive underground network sprawling beneath it. Now, although it must be there, we never visit it or hardly ever see it. It's the sewers. These marvels of Victorian engineering, be they in London, Manchester or Liverpool, carry away millions of gallons of sewage and rainwater every year, well over a century since they were originally built. But how did we learn to build such remarkable subterranean structures? Most people think that the Victorian engineering sewage story started in London with Joseph Bazalgette. But another engineering genius beat him to it here in Wapping. Whilst hundreds of commuters use this staircase every day, what they may not realise is that this shaft was originally dug to get workers down to a level below the bottom of the River Thames, to attempt a task that many had thought impossible. Once the shaft was dug, work began on the tunnel on the 2nd of March 1855 and continued for 15 years. The Thames broke in more than once and many workers drowned or others died of fever. But that tunnel was the first of many that would be dug under the Thames. And today, the Thames Tunnel is still used as a key part of London's underground system. The genius behind its construction was Isambard Kingdom Brunel's father, Mark. While briefly in debtor's prison, he witnessed a small worm burrowing through rotten wood. That worm, Torido Navalis, the common shipworm, inspired him to come up with a burrowing device based on the worm's shell-like head. It was a giant plate that the men could stand on, allowing them to dig their tunnel and pass the spoil behind, just as the worm did. The project went on for so long that Mark fell ill, and his son Isambard took over and finally finished the project successfully. The lessons learned from the project were keenly taken up by other engineers and allowed the Victorian sewers to be built nationwide, including the one at Brighton. We're about 15 feet underground at the moment. We are now going down to about 25 feet underground to the main stormwater tunnel, one of the outlets. As you can see here, this is spring water running through the sewer system at the moment. It's not sewage at all. But I've noticed it's round there, but it's egg-shaped over there. The reason why it's an egg-shaped bowl is because the Victorians are very, very clever. The idea of making an egg-shaped bowl literally were three things. One, because it's stronger than a round barrel. Two, because it can hold more capacity. And the best thing that happened was that it threw all the water to the bottom of the V if they turned the egg shape upside down, which would allow the sewer system to flow. I'm surprised here we are in one of the deepest parts, and it really, it isn't that smelly at all. No, Brighton sewers are not smelly because uh, the Victorians put air vents, a lot of air vents on the system right the way through the town. Now, a lot of the air vents are hidden behind the hotels, so no one knows that they're there. We've, we've only come across the air vents when we've found like block drains and we trace the sewer system through. Oh my, looks like you've got a leak. It certainly does. If you like to stick your finger in the hole, like really? the little boy, yeah, like the little boy from Holland, just to stop the dam, as you used to say. Now, what this is, this is just pure spring water, and we normally leave them break through the brickwork, otherwise it builds up pressure and it could blow the bricks out. But they're quite safe and they're very harmless. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. What was it like actually building the place? Well, I don't think it was actually that unhygienic, actually, because they've actually built seating places like this so they could sit down and have their dinner. Right, 
Chris. Uh, we're just coming now up to the Steen overflow chamber, which as you can see, is a massive chamber. I've noticed there's no pumps here, or the sound of pumps at least. No, because it's all gravity. As I explained earlier, when they built the egg-shaped valves to make the sewer system flow, and this is why um, the sewer system works so well. Are there rats down here? There are rats, but because we've been walking around and making noise, we probably scared them away, but there's not many rats in the sewer system. But I do know that there are some living things down here, up on the wall there. Uh, yes, there's tree roots up on the wall there. How come? Well, during 1987, when we had the big hurricane, um, the trees come down for water. They've literally broken through now the uh, brickwork and come down into the sewer system to, to feed on the water. Is it going to cause a problem to the stability of the place? No, no, because we keep an eye on the, the stability and if it needs any, you know, if it does do any damage, we'll cut the roots away and re out the joints. I can hear water, but I can't see it. Yes, Chris, if you look in this direction, on the left-hand side, you've got the London Road sewer. On the right-hand, you've got the Lewis Road sewer. And they're two great big eight-foot barrels. And what happens is the sewer is the other side of that wall. Now, if we have heavy rain, it will come down the two sewer systems into this section. And it'll only go into a five-foot pipe here. So the amount of water will literally overflow this into here and then run down the two barrels out to the stormwater barrel. This network seems to go on forever. How large is it? In Brighton, we've got over 44 miles of sewer system. Then we could literally put a boat in the sewer system and go around and check all the brickwork and, and the stability of the sewer. Is that a job you get many volunteers for? Uh, yeah, people like doing that, actually, because it's not like it's in here with a few lights. It's literally pitch black and cat lands and just float around. It's like a tunnel of love. We have witnessed smugglers' caves, catacombs, and even whole subterranean cities in this tour of underground Britain. So next time you see a trapdoor or a manhole cover, pay close attention. There are many wonderful places and secrets to discover, and you can find many of them if you look close enough at the world right under your feet. Now,